from the D-Day landings on the beaches of France in June 1944, all the way to the end of the war in Europe in May 1945, the tank crews of the Sherwood Rangers Yeomanry saw almost constant fighting in that last year of the conflict. But what was everyday life like for a tank crew? Have you ever wondered how you make a cup of tea in a tank? Or how you go to the toilet? Well then, you've come to the right place. Welcome to Let's Talk Tanks with me, Emily, the family learning producer at the National Army Museum. Today, we're gonna to set off on a mission to discover what it was really like for a Second World War tank crew. We'll be taking a closer look at their roles, their kit, and even speaking to tank expert, James Holland, as we discover what it was like to fight and survive on board a Second World War tank. I'm here at the Tank Museum in Dorset, inside a Sherman tank. But who was who in a British Army tank crew? Well, a tank crew was typically made up of five people, and each person had an integral role to play. First up, you have the commander, and there's a slight clue in their name. They are in charge of the tank and responsible for any decisions made in battle. They're also in charge of the radio, which was a really essential piece of kit inside the tank. Next up, you have the driver and the co-driver. For the driver and the co-driver, it was all about getting the tank to where it needed to go. They were stuck in a cramped position and they needed to keep a cool head in times of intense pressure. The gunner was in charge of firing the gun on the tank. Now, I'm inside a tank right now and it is just so, so cramped and although the gunner it might sound like they have an easy job you've got to factor in they're in this tight cramped space there's noise all around them they're moving across bumpy terrain and that they're trying to hit another moving target this certainly wasn't an easy job last but not least you have the loader the loader was responsible for supplying the ammunition to keep the gun firing they had three different types to choose from smoke high explosive or armour piercing. They really needed physical strength and stamina to keep up with the pace. Now, to keep a tank moving on all four cylinders, both in and out of battle, was no easy ride. From mechanical issues to rats chewing through the wires, it was really important for a tank crew to work together as a team, think on their feet and remain calm under pressure. Now we know a little bit more about the different roles in a tank crew, let's take a closer look at their kit. When you stop and think about it, a tank is basically just a big metal box on wheels. It's bound to get pretty hot, smelly and stuffy in there before you add in an engine and five crew members. However, the winter of 1944 to 1945, when the Sherwood Rangers Yeomanry were crossing Europe, it was freezing, freezing cold, even inside the tanks. Tank crews needed a uniform that was a little bit different to your standard soldier's kit. Enter the pixie suit. The pixie suit was designed as winter wear for tank crews. It's warm with a thick lining and rubberized parts which make it waterproof. It has a zip that runs all the way from the top to the bottom, meaning you can get in and out of it easily. In fact, you could even zip the legs together to turn it into a sleeping bag. Something I really like about the pixie suit is its pockets, often in quite unusual places. If you were the driver or the co-driver, you'd be sat down, so you wouldn't be able to reach something from a pocket on your waist or your hips, but you could reach something from a pocket on your leg. Now, I'm sure you're wondering, why is it called the pixie suit? Well, can you see these poppers on the back here? These are used to attach a hood, another way of keeping tank crews warm and dry. However, when you were in the suit, fully zipped up, hood on, it did look a little bit like the pointy hats worn by pixies and elves in fairy tales, hence the name the pixie suit. The British Army produced a few different variations of the pixie suit to suit tank crews working in different climates and environments such as the jungle and the desert. I think the winter weight pixie suit is my favourite though. 
To really understand what it was like for the tank crews of the Sherwood Rangers Yeomanry, I think we need to speak to an expert. Let me introduce James Holland. James is a historian, author, and all-round font of knowledge when it comes to tanks. So, James, what can you tell me about this tank that we're stood in front of here? What's it got to do with the Sherwood Rangers Yeomanry? Well, this is the ubiquitous Sherman tank. Now, this is a this is a British adapted version. It's a Firefly with a 17-pounder gun in it, and that's a really high-velocity gun. Uh, and velocity is a speed through which the projectile, the shell, actually passes through the air. The mainstay was a 75 millimeter one, which had a slightly lower velocity. And really, it was the most, it's the second most produced tank in the world ever after the T-34. 49,000 of the Sherman tanks were produced. 74,000 Sherman hulls, which were adapted to other things. A lot of the parts are very, very transferable. Um, but a very, very good all-round tank. You know, mechanically reliable, easy to repair, very quick firing gun, lots of things in its favor. And the Sherwood Rangers were using them from the Battle of Alamein in October 1942 right through to the end of the war. Sherman Fireflies were coming in for D-Day. Can you tell me a little bit more about what it would have been like inside a tank? What kind of things would you be able to hear? What could you smell? Yeah, it's pretty uncomfortable, to be perfectly honest. I mean, a Sherman is more roomy than most a lot of tanks, but even so, it's pretty cramped. There's lots of things for you to kind of knock your shoulder on, your elbow, head or whatever. Um, incredibly noisy, lots of fumes. You know, this was, this was not an, an age of health and safety executive. This was not an age where people were worrying about, um, you know, polluting the planet or anything like that. So you would, it, it would be really, really uncomfortable. I mean, a crew were, were very, very tight. You had, you know, um, you would all have to completely trust one another. You're all completely interdependent on one another. Um, Food-wise, smell-wise, the smell in there would have been pretty unpleasant, sweaty in summer. Mm. Um, you know, it would have smelt of, of, of kind of sort of pee and things like that yeah. as well. Yeah. Fumes from firing, cordite, mm. you know, it gets in. There isn't a kind of an extractor there, but, but even so, it's kind of sort of residual. Mm. So the smell of sort of rubber and metal and oil and, and urine and, and sweat. Yeah. And, you know, it's pretty, it's, it gets pretty, pretty high in there, to be perfectly mm. honest. Not very comfortable at all. Do you think it was fair to say that for the tank crews, the tank was kind of like their home, the place where they slept, relaxed, worked? And with that in mind, how would they make their dinner or a cup of tea when they were not, you know, driving about in their tank? Yeah, the, t the tank absolutely is their home. It's their complete base. And, and, and you know, even in a crew, a five-man crew, you know, you might have an officer as the commander of the, uh, of the tank. It's all Christian names. It's, it's yeah. first name terms. It's, no one stands on cer ceremony because you're all, you're all in it together. So, yes, you would have lots of stowage on the outside of the yeah. tank. So canvas, sacks of, and, and baggage and so on. Um, you'd have all the kind of soft stuff on the outside. Um, you'd have a few, you might have a few creature comforts inside, but very, very few and far between. Lots of people had pets. I mean, so there were crews with dogs in there and, and all sorts of stuff. And you might have a chicken wandering around, you know, for extra eggs. Um, but your food would come from ration packs. So you'd get composite rations. Um, and you'd either, that'd either be kind of, you know, a, a, a pack for seven days for one man or, or for seven people for one day. And you'd have a little prim primer stove, a little sort of stove, um, basic, basic stove. And you would make your food on the outside of the tank for the most part. And people would brew up tea whenever they could. You know, whenever there was a pause, and there were lots of pauses, lots of hanging around, waiting for mines to be cleared or something to happen or orders to come through, you would make a cup of tea. It's, it's, like, it's like that nectar that just keeps everyone going. It's not tea as you and I would know it. It's, it's tea leaves, carnation, you know, um, milk, it's that sort of horrible sort of sweet long life milk, sugar, all stirred in together, brewed up on a pot, whooshed down with it in your, uh, you know, your enamel tin mug. Uh, and that would be drunk a lot during the day. And with all that talk of eating and drinking, I mean, looking around, I can't see a toilet on the Firefly. <laughs> so how do you go to the toilet in a tank? Basically what you do, if you need to do a number two, you, you'd wander off with a shovel and you'd go behind a hedge and you'd dig a hole and you'd squat down and, and just do your business. Um, but, uh, and similarly, you just go and pee in a hedge yeah. if you needed to go. But if you're, obviously you're absolutely desperate and it's the middle of a battle, you just have to go wherever you can. Yeah. And that's usually into a shell case and then you chuck it out later. But it's pretty basic, you know, it's pretty, pretty brutal. Uh, and you know, you just, I suppose you just get used to it, mm. don't you? I mean, it's like sort of very, very sort of bare bones mm. camping. I mean, you know, it's the same as sleeping. You know, you'd just be kind of, you might sleep under the tank. You might sleep in the tank. Mm. You might just pull a tarpaulin out from the side, something like that. But, but it's really, really rudimentary. 
no creature comforts really. How would you sum up the experience of the Sherwood Rangers Yeomanry in that last year of the war? Yeah, really, really, really unbelievably tough. I mean, there is this sort of ongoing perception, I think, that, that Northwest Europe from June 1944 to the V-Day in May 1945, somehow the sort of British and the Western Allies had it lightly compared to what was going on to the Eastern Front. Well, possibly, it depends on which part of the army you are, because what one has to understand is that the way British and American armies are organised is that they're very kind of, they have a very, very long tail. So the logistical chain, the supply chain is incredibly long. Uh, and what that means is you've got an awful lot of service troops. So in the case of the British Army, 43% are service troops, only 14% are infantry, and only 8% are part of armoured units, tank units. But of those tank units, only about 48% of those are actually in tanks. So it's a very, very small number. But those who are, the chances of getting through unscathed are statistically absolutely zero. And in the case of the Sherwood Rangers, their casualty rate was 142%. And it was 52% dead if you were an officer. So unbelievably brutal. You know, it's just, you're in the front line all the time. And so law of averages says that at some point there's going to be a shell, a bit of shrapnel, a sort of bit of mortar or whatever that's sort of got your name on it. And, and that was the case. There wasn't a single Sherwood Rangers tank that landed on D-Day that went all the way through to the end of the war that wasn't hit at some point. And do you think there was just a real strain on those that were in command in the tank crew? Yeah, it's, it's just the responsibility of those people is mm. just absolutely incredible. I mean, if you're a tank commander, you've got to have your head out of the turret because you can mm. see on there they've got periscopes. But those periscopes, they're like tiny little windows and you can't mm. see. You have to have 360 degree vision. So you've got to be watching, watching, watching all the time. As a tank commander, you're listening to your own crew on the intercom because it's so noisy in there. Otherwise, you can't hear yourself think. So you're listening to that. Then you're listening to the rest of the squadron of 19 tanks mm. on the B net, which is a particular type of frequency on your radio then you're listening to the rest of the, re the regiment on the a net mm -hmm. and the infantry so you've got three different sequences of, of voices that you've got to be listening to you've got to be watching all the time because the moment you're not watching is the moment you're going to get hit so concentration 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 and incredibly long days days that in certainly in in the summer of 1944 might start as early as 3 30 in the morning and might not finish till after midnight so you're just dead on your feet it's just I don't know how they did it. I don't know how they did it. And at the same time, they've got to adapt to, they've got to make snap decisions and, and snap orders on, you know, on basis of those orders, you know, lives might be lost. So, you, you know, huge responsibility. And, you know, it's just, um, it's just the relentlessness of it. It's just, you know, they're in action pretty much the whole time. I mean, Sherwood Rangers um, ended up with 18 battle honours between D-Day and the end of the war and 30 in the entire war and that put them as the single unit with more battle honours than any other in the British Army and the reason they're getting all these battle honours is because they're in battle all the time so it was absolutely brutal. Although we might think of tanks in terms of size, speed, armour or weapons, it was the crews inside that kept them moving, fighting, surviving in that last year of the Second World War. And tank crews weren't just from the UK either. You had Indian tank crews in the British Indian Army fighting in Italy, Africa and Burma, now Myanmar. In Russia, you had female tank commanders and women in other combat roles. Thanks for watching Let's Talk Tanks. I hope to see you in the museum sometime soon.